Jesus and the miraculous catch of fish. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realise that it was Jesus. He called out to them, Friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, Throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment round him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not very far from the shore, about a hundred metres. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. <laughs> Do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you were old, You will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. This is the end of the reading. Jesus. And may I introduce Reverend Han Brody to come and open the scriptures to us. Good morning, everyone. Really nice to be here with you this morning. Um, And there's a particular reason, nice anyway, to come and share um, with another congregation. But I have a particular reason for being pleased to be here this morning. And that's a historical one. Um, Because my dad was baptised at St Peter's exactly 100 years ago. 
Um, he, he lived in the parish, I've got my bearings right, probably 200 yards over, over there um, in Lavender Road, um, which a house long since uh, demolished, I, w I would add, uh, which had, I remember, had a loo in the garden, didn't have one inside. So, um, but um, the family um, were based here. And, um, and for good measure, my mum was probably not 200 yards ago, pro uh, probably about 300 yards away over there in what was Cambala Road before that was all demolished um, as well. Um, so I'm Battersea born and bred. Um, our family house um, wasn't actually down in North Battersea, um, it, but South Battersea, um, as, as, as far as you can get before you can get to Clapham, basically, uh, right up by Clapham Common. As I say, I'm, I'm totally Battersea born and bred, so it's a particular uh, pleasure um, to, be, to be sharing with you um, this morning. So let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will open our ears to hear your word, our minds to understand, and our hearts to receive it. Amen. One of the things that saddens me about our society becoming increasingly secular is the way in which we're losing the pattern of the church year. In particular, how we celebrate our great festivals. If you take Christmas as, as an example, instead of marking the waiting season of Advent, the nation at large parties all the way through December and then moves on as soon as they've got Boxing Day out of the way, moves on to something else. Perception of Easter is worse. Many are focused simply on chocolate and the long holiday weekend, not interested in the significance of the season. The waiting of Lent is generally ignored. And once again, after the bank holiday is over, so is Easter. But in theory, the church celebrates its greatest festival of the year for 50 days until we get to the day of Pentecost, Pentecostos, 50th. And it's a real treat to be able to dwell on celebrating the joy of the season of Easter as we consider what the resurrection means to our lives so let's make the most of it and not try and rush on till we get uh, to the next thing. Moral, moreover, the hope we have to share is truly a priceless gift. As Christians, we're called to live and be good news to everyone. Truly, as Augustine said, to be an Easter people. Now, I don't know whether here you've been following the set readings recently, but over the last couple of weeks, the gospel passages have been looking at examples of people meeting with the risen Christ, the women at the tomb, the disciples in the upper room, most specifically Thomas, of course, who had his doubts completely cast aside. And today we consider the account of the disciples' encounter with Jesus on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And we hear of Peter's fresh start. One wonderful aspect of the resurrection is that it has so much to do with new beginnings. Not least occasions when people meet with the risen Jesus for themselves sometimes in a very dramatic way. And lives are changed forever. I nearly chose the reading from Acts about the call of St. Paul on the road to Damascus to remind us of the sudden and dramatic way in which God can change lives. Paul's conversion produced a profound change of mind and a complete turnaround in behaviour. From being a persecutor of Christians 
to becoming one of the greatest leaders and evangelists. This account of Paul's experiences tells us what can happen when a person is confronted by the living Christ and makes a completely new beginning. At the centre of that new beginning is the image of the crucifixion. And we're reminded that resurrection life was purchased at the cost of sacrificial love. Sudden conversion experiences do still occur, of course. But most of us consider faith over a longer period. However it happens, many of us here this morning will recognise what it's like to experience their own new beginning. As Christians, we're all encouraged when we hear of someone new coming to faith. But I'd suggest that for most of us here this morning, it's Peter's story, rather than Paul's, that has more direct relevance to us at this stage of our journey of faith. So I'd like to focus on the type of new beginning we hear about in our gospel story. It's different in that Peter is not meeting Jesus for the first time. The account makes it clear. One of the functions of resurrection life is restoration of relationship and deep forgiveness. And that surely is something which we all need to hear, no matter how long we've known Jesus, or indeed whether we are yet to meet him. As we look at this passage this morning, I'd like you to think of yourself in Peter's place as he faces Jesus. I don't mean in his particular setting, but in your own. I don't think it's too much to ask if you think about it. His enthusiasm, his awkwardness, lack of understanding, alongside his love for Jesus are very much like ours. He's already let him down and denied him. And as we follow through the story, I'm just going to pick up on some of Jesus' words and invite you to consider what your own response might be. I'm sure you know what's happened up to this point in account you likely read in the approach to Good Friday. Peter had previously denied Jesus and fled from the scene of his crucifixion. Peter evidently loved Jesus and wanted to follow him, but his fear had led him to distance himself. And we are left to imagine how he must have felt. Probably overwhelming disappointment with himself, guilt, shame. And although he since witnessed the appearance of Jesus on Easter Day, all these issues are yet to be resolved. Peter announces he's going fishing, and several of the disciples decide to go along. We do not know his motives, but here he is, soon after the greatest event in human history back doing what he knows best. Perhaps he needed some time doing something ordinary, wanted to find some space, get away from people, try and think through what was happening. Or it might have simply been the practical answer that it was to feed the disciples at that time, possibly even to make a little money. Whatever the reason, it sets the scene for a more personal meeting between Peter and Jesus. One in which the relationship will be fully restored. After a night of fishing, the group has caught no fish at all. 
so added to Peter's sense of failure and inadequacy in denying Jesus. It's as if to rub it in. He cannot even succeed in his own line of work. Just after daybreak, the disciples see a man on the shore, but at that point, they don't recognise him. He calls out to them that they should cast their net on the right-hand side of the boat. When the disciples do so, there are so many fish in the net, they are unable to haul it in. It would have been all too easy for the disciples to ignore the instruction they were given. They were probably tired. They'd been out all night. And anyway, what did this man know about fishing that they didn't? Might that be how you would have responded? And if so, look what you might have missed out on. So let me pause there for a moment. Can you think of an occasion when Jesus asked you to cast your net on the other side of the boat? Not in those words, of course, but equivalent ones. A time when you've been asked to do something different from what you expected. Perhaps against your own instinct. If you have, it's likely you didn't feel very safe. Yet somehow you had a sense all the way through that God was in it. It's easy enough for us to give the right answer from a distance. We all know we should be obedient and put our trust in God. Tick, right answer. But it's not usually so straightforward when we're banging in the middle of it. If we're not sure, of course, we know we need to pray about it. Perhaps consult with a trusted friend. But don't ignore it. When the beloved disciple shouts, it is the Lord, Peter immediately steps into the water and heads towards the shore. Perhaps catching that large number of fish after there had been nothing reminds him of other times of abundance. The turning of the water into wine. The feeding of thousands of people with few resources. Jesus invites the disciples to come and have breakfast as though this were any other morning. And the text serves to emphasise that this is indeed the real Jesus, not a vision or a figment of the imagination, but a living, breathing human being. I read an interesting comment about this story when I was preparing during the week, which was that it provides a bookend to the Last Supper, that this first breakfast changes the whole trajectory for the disciples from grief and confusion to purpose and mission. Everything Jesus said to his disciples before his crucifixion is now starting to fall into place. But first, Jesus has some very specific business with Peter. Before his arrest, Jesus told Peter he would deny him three times. And as we know, this is exactly what happened. Further, he runs away. He's absent from the crucifixion. He's among the disciples who meet behind locked doors out of fear. And now Jesus speaks to him directly. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Jesus asks him three times. And three times Peter is given the opportunity 
to declare his love for Jesus. Once for each time he denied him. A fact that Peter would not have missed. Although I wonder if at first he felt frustrated Jesus made him repeat what he was saying. Each time Jesus says, then feed my sheep, take care of my sheep. Thus Peter's given the opportunity to face his risen Lord and begin again. The word forgiveness is not actually mentioned Yet we know it lies at the heart of what has happened. Peter's now recommissioned not only to fish for people, but also to be a shepherd of God's flock. And he knows his future will be full of risk. For the authentic Christian life, for us, as for Peter, does not allow us to stay safely where we are. Hear Jesus' words spoken to you. He calls you by name and asks if you love him. What is your response? And what are the consequences? I'm sure most of us can recall times when God felt close And we declared our undying allegiance. But I also guess that subsequently, it's not always been plain sailing. How often do you fail to live up to what you profess? It's fairly straightforward to be positive in our faith when things are going well. But it's another story when everything seems to be against us when we feel completely out of our depth. Jesus doesn't ask if we love him for his benefit, but for ours. Jesus knows our hearts and intentions. He knows and understands and gives us another another chance. We're reminded that when we turn back to him, we're completely forgiven. The slate is wiped clean. And we can start again, and again, and again. Moreover, we are loved unconditionally. Despite any feelings of inadequacy, we're invited to join in God's work. Reminded we do so, not in our own strength, but his. So what does that mean for you? Is there anything that holds you back from the abundant life that Jesus promises? Perhaps feelings which do not belong in God's post-resurrection world. Maybe feelings of guilt, shame, inadequacy. If we fully understood ourselves to be completely forgiven, set free from the powers of sin and death, and unconditionally loved and accepted for who we are. How might that change the choices we make about our lives? The power of resurrection reminds us we're no longer held back by the past and encourages us to move forward, learning to become the people God wants us to be. The implications of this story also resonate in our faith communities. Here in Battersea, are we making correct choices about the mission and ministry of our churches? Are we inward looking, constrained by the past, sticking to how we've always done things? Or are we pointed forward with a certain hope of the resurrection behind us? If we are completely loved, completely forgiven and completely free, What does that imply about how we are to tend God's flock? We're called not only to proclaim God's love, 
modelled for us in the person of Jesus Christ. But to act on it. We know God's love is for everyone, yet it needs our participation to make it real for others. I know many of us here this morning will have personal cause to be grateful to the people in our lives who heard Jesus' call to take care of his sheep and responded with love. Now it's our turn. The light of resurrection completely changes our perspective, banishing fear and replacing it with love. In relationship with Jesus, we're always able to renew our commitment and make a fresh start. He invites us to alter our viewpoint, to cast our net on the other side of the boat. When he asks us if we love him and we respond positively with heart and soul, he entrusts us with his work. So let us pray that we may always be responsive to the God who calls us, as well as worthy of that calling. And light like finish with this prayer. Father God, your Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread and in the nets filled with fish. Open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work and may join him in fishing, in welcoming, and in shepherding his people the people he calls, all God's children. Amen.